more than we've been getting, at least anyway. It's been dry. Friday crew is in the house. We have uh, holdovers from the first half hour. You just heard Bill Stubblefield. We have Mike the Badger Height, although that nickname could change soon. You'll find out why. <laughs> <clears throat> the senior member of our crew, Michael Carl. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, gentlemen. We Good. welcome in Larry Schultz, who is uh, dressed appropriately for the upcoming football game. It would appear to absolutely no one in the West Virginia side of the audience. Good morning, Larry. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> and uh, Joe, Joey Torts ready via telephone. Joe? Good morning, everybody. Good morning Good to morning. you. Now, uh, yesterday, there was an influx of photographs that arrived on my phone. Mr. Hornby was uh, <laughs> diligently at work late into the evening hours. Now, the problem is that uh, they arrived at an hour uh, that did not allow me to take full advantage of these photos. For the most part. <laughs> so what I've decided... <laughs> Ferretti is sweating it out over here. Oh, no. <laughs> so what I've decided to do is I will, I'm going to spoon these photos with appropriate introductions out in the, into the future. right? But one of them was so good that it had to be addressed immediately. And, and I'm going to get to that. <laughs> but not just yet. That's going to come. Uh, so... Uh, Instead, uh, we'll go with the regular intros with just the one exception. So I will start off first, like last week, with our buddy Mike Carl. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. It's a big week for Mike Carl and his fellow Mountaineers. Saturday, they go to Happy Valley. Not a good place over the years. They last won at Penn State in 1954. And Mike will tell you, even he doesn't remember that score. If the ears lose this one badly, there will be only one way to erase that frown. And that's by quickly doing the inevitable and firing Neil Brown. I hope that doesn't happen, but it's possible. Now, uh, this next one is going to cause me to put this music on hold. And this was uh, a request sent in by Brad Knoll following last week's intro using Johnny Cash music. Uh, he thought some CDB would be more appropriate this week for this intro. And uh, it's going to require a little artistic interpretation by myself here. So give me a moment. <clears throat> Donald Trump called down to Georgia. He was looking for an election to steal. He was in a bind, he was way behind, and he was willing to make a deal. When he called upon this one man who was the Georgia Secretary of State, Trump said, Brad, you're not half bad. Now I think I've got an idea that's great. I guess you didn't know it, but I'm an elected man too. Now find me 11,780 votes and take some notes because I think I'm better than you. Brad said, listen, Trump, don't be asking me to sneak around like Ursay moving the Colts. And next time you want to call me, you talk to my new attorney first, Larry Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> All right, so that is, that is uh, well, like I said, the artistic interpretation that I needed for that one. So, uh, Joe, last week you missed uh, Johnny Cash. Go a little something like So this. I go back to the regular hey. intros now, and for intro number three, I'm going to need Colin McLaughlin uh, toward the end of this one to bring up a lovely photo come on. we've all come to know mike height as the badger lately but maybe we messed up that nickname and messed it up greatly for new evidence has emerged and transpired and for this a much more accurate nickname is required something softer something nicer than a badger is needed i hear as this photo shows this guy is now to be known as the porn stash cuddle bear <laughs> 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 look, at look at those eyes. Look at those eyes. Yeah. Huh? That's Mike and his wife, Pam. Right? Yes, it is. Hi, you were a cute kid. Very young. Huh? Very young. You're a handsome young man. Now, now, Colin, cut to what height looks like now. <laughs> and this is how the years have treated him. <laughs> Harshly. <laughs> Uh, what are you going to say, Larry? Not so bad. Not so bad. Because <laughs> Larry fears that his picture is going to be like... <laughs> yeah, thank God I didn't grow up around yeah, here. Oh, no, no, we got we got evidence on you, Larry. It's coming in the future. Just focus on my beautiful wife. And <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. You married up, like most of us. Yes. All right, we move on now. And in this one, we have the uh, we have Joe Ferretti, who's very happy that I'm not using any of the photos I got last night. Aren't you, Joe? 
Uh, he's our leadoff hitter, yeah. but he was absent last week. And in his stead, it was John Gilstrap who did first speak. When Gilstrap read his intro, it was truly master prose. But what it was about, eh, nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope Gilstrap is listening. <laughs> He's trying to reach that spot on his back where the knife went in. <laughs> <laughs> So he's not a New York Times bestseller, but he returns today if he's ready. So I bring to you, ladies and gentlemen, the very relieved Joe Joey Torts for ready. <laughs> oh, I love an intro that cuts on somebody else. That's great. <laughs> I understand. They say even a broken clock is right twice a day. But what about the other 23 hours and 50 min 58 minutes, I say? Well, that clock was right here on Monday. And listen up, nerds. Because Bill Stubblefield began the week by flawlessly nailing two words. <laughs> <laughs> they say the surprises that are best are the surprises you get when you're young. Until this past Monday morning, when the words anatomy and physiology rolled smoothly off the Admiral's tongue. <laughs> I'm, I'm with Joe. I like it better when somebody else has been cut on my section. <laughs> Well, Bill, and then you you did it again to us this yeah. morning, again flowing smoothly I, with a multisyllabic word. I'm so impressed. Yeah, I I'm going home at night and practicing, <laughs> and uh, and Bonnie's there playing a Rob, but she's playing a nice <laughs> Rob. <laughs> Rob's always and, nice. a, and accommodating Rob. <laughs> But I'm working on it. I'm trying to emulate, uh, that's another one, emulate my kite. With this, with wow, this. I, I am so impressed right now. <laughs> the advantage of doing the intros is they don't get turned on me because I get to read them Monday. <laughs> 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 All right, leadoff hitter, Torch, you're up. Issue number one. Rob, Rob in, a, in a Utah high school not long ago, uh, a video, a sexually explicit video, was circulating amongst the students there. And there was a rumor that perhaps it was a video of one of the teachers at the school. Uh, and this all circulated around the school within a matter of a, just a couple of days via Snapchat. And, of course, all the students with their phones were sharing this video. Not long after that, a mother called the superintendent of the school, uh, emotionally distraught, sobbing on the phone and indicating that, you know, I, 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 she's told the superintendent, I don't know about this. I, it's something my daughter cannot unsee. And she asked the superintendent, what are you going to do about this? Of course, I raised that story because uh, locally we had our own social media uh, incident at a local middle school in the Martinsburg area here this week. And it, it raises the concern that I think we all have about social media. And we can take this discussion in any number of, of uh, avenues. But Clearly, there's a problem here uh, because we suffered a, a quite a uh, little kerfuffle up there at North Middle School. The, the, the instruction day was interrupted. We had police responding. We had parents responding both on their own social media accounts and, and also in person. We had school officials then having to come forward and issue statements and clarify what was found, what was not found, and the school's reaction to the whole thing. It's very upsetting. To, to all concerned. And I'm just wondering what we can do about this, because this is going to continue. Uh, the, the perpetrator was a 10-year-old boy from the state of Michigan, reportedly a repeat offender of this kind of activity, who had essentially posted a threat against a student at North Middle, prompting all of this uh, response. How are we going to deal with th this, this problem? Uh, and we can look at it from the perspective of government regulation. We can look at it from the responsibility of parents and those who have social media accounts. We can look at the school response to this and, and, and you know, do we have to look more at how we react as opposed to how do we uh, stop this kind of nonsense? Uh, and, and I know a lot of people have talked about the school response, uh, whether it was good or bad or whether they're indifferent about it. Uh, it's another aspect to all this. So, for the discussion this morning, I really want to just delve into how do we deal with this on any number of levels, because it's here to stay. We know social media is not going anywhere. We know the impact that social media has. It moves markets. It ruins commercial products. It shapes our politics, our economics. So how do we, how do we deal with this major problem? Uh, do we harden schools? Do we just look at how we respond or 
do we look at maybe curtailing use, misuse, uh, and, and having accountability behind all this? Uh, that, that's the topic I want to discuss this morning. All right. There, there are a lot of different angles on this one, legislatively, legally, too. So let's uh, let's go with Attorney Larry Schultz first on this one. Sure. Um, first of all, you have to take a look at the criminal law, it seems to me. Um, if we're talking about, um, you know, movie shots and, and film shots that are not permitted for children under a certain age, then you're beginning uh, with this. Now, is... Arresting a 10-year-old uh, who did this in the first place going to cure this problem? It seems like not. It'll cure it in his case, most likely. And I would think that that kid's ability to get a, uh, his hands on a, a machine attached to the Internet is going to be pretty small uh, for a long time. Uh, but I, I, there's not enough of an answer in the criminal law. Um I think in the end, you have to go back to the communication companies, the telecommunication companies that are sponsoring this and say, you need a solution so that you're not revealing this to 10 year olds. And if you can't come up with a solution, then maybe you're not going to be fit uh, to be sanctioned to do this in our society. I don't know how they will do it. I, I can't think of a way. Uh, on the other hand, I don't, you know, I'm not a computer expert. I don't know that much about it. But, you know, if you're running a magazine, a print magazine, you have rules you have to follow to get, you know, you don't go down there on the day it's published and hand it out uh, for 10 bucks a copy to little kids. And so there's got to be a way to limit that. Um, and it, it's on the telecommunications industry to find one. Delegate Michael Height. So I would agree with you, but I, I think maybe they have already done some of that. And, and I'm going to push back on the parental responsibility here that a lot of these, these platforms have parental controls. And I think parents have gotten lackadaisical in their attitude towards a lot of these platforms, and they're not setting the parental controls um, on phones. And, and you see kids younger and younger getting phones as, as young as 8, 10 years old. I'm not sure why an 8-year-old needs a, a, a cell phone. But, you know, it allows them to download these platforms and, and to see some of this stuff that they probably shouldn't be seeing. And, and parents have to take a, a certain responsibility here. They have to go in and set the parental controls on these phones and make sure that they're, they're you know, and check them every once in a while. You know, Kids you just can't. how to unset them. Right. Just um, as quick as they set them. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they're a whole lot smarter than their parents when it comes <laughs> to technology a lot of times. But there are ways uh, out there to, to set these parental controls and to have them stay. And, you know, I just think parents have to take um, – a more active role in what their kids have on their phones, what platforms they're on, and and not just on their phones, but the video games and stuff that they're playing at home. Um, that some of these platforms like Snapchat, you know, that that send pictures around and stuff like that. Um, a, a lot of them, you know, once you viewed the picture, it's gone. You know, it, it just like disappears. But so there's there's no record of it uh, a lot of times. So. But you also have Facebook, and Facebook, there's parental parental controls on that, and there's there's I think that industry has tried to say you have to be a certain age before you can have certain parameters within this. So, you know, I, I'm not sure how much more the actual um, the corporations can do that have social media corporations um, than they're already doing, uh, and I'm not sure as a legislator. What legislation do we put out there to try to stop this? That's going to be effective. I mean, because you can always put out legislation, but what is what do we do that's going to be effective? Is the real key. Is there a failure to use parental controls a form of child neglect? Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, right? I, I mean, uh, I, could maybe. you write a statute that says it is? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you have to ask, what I'm asking. Joe. You you talk yeah. about this woman, you know, that, that says, you know, how do my child can't unsee what she's seen? Well. How did she gain access to it to begin with? I mean, maybe maybe that's what I'm saying, that these, this parent should be looking inward. Why did my child see this? Because I allowed them to. 
Bill. Yeah, uh, parental control is something we should seek, but I think it's going to be a aspirational. It's never going to happen. There's going to be some good parents. There's going to be other parents that Agreed. don't care. Uh, so uh, you, you cannot get a, an envelope that's cover all parents. Plus, we have the element of free speech, and we tried to have some control of social media at the tail end of the Trump administration and uh, and there was a huge uh, pushback of trying to limit what somebody could say. Uh, it's not an easy nut to crack and I'm not sure that one one solution is going to cover all of it. But let's go back to the point that Joe referenced a few minutes ago about this uh, uh, kid from Michigan, 10-year-old kid from Michigan, getting on a, 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 a chat room and threatened a kid in Berkeley County. Uh, I think something like that can be controlled. I think technology is available. That the limit, when they're within inside the school buildings, that only those pre-approved telephone numbers, i.e. from a parent, can actually penetrate uh, the, the school building. We can do that with technology. So there are certain elements of the problem that I think can be addressed. The overall larger element of social media, how it influences, especially during the formative years of a child, when they're home, when they're away from the schools, uh, that falls back upon the parents, but we have seen time and time and time again that many parents are engaged in other activities and they do not pay as much attention to what the child is receiving as what they should. In hindsight, they said, I should have done something, but in real time, they do less than they they might. Well, in that regard, I think the legislature probably could do something. We need to take a close look of, of whether or not we should allow cell phones in schools for kids. Um, I went through an entire 12 years in high school or through school without ever having a phone. Um, and my parents could always call the school if they needed to get hold of me. There was always an avenue to, to which they could do that. Today's society, I mean, every kid has a phone. And a lot of times who they're texting with is their parents back home during class and stuff like that. And, and we need to take a look at that. Parents, I don't know why parents need to have 24-7 access to their kids, especially when they're supposed to be in school learning. Mike, I agree, but a different a generational change. We have come a, a long way since since certainly I was in school and to a lesser degree when you were in school. Uh, it's But it's aspirational. I do not think we can ex we should expect parents to take this as serious as they should. I'm not talking about all parents. I'm talking about some parents. And, uh, uh, yeah, someone say ban uh, all phones from schools. That's been tried, but then there's been a tremendous amount of pushback from parents' groups saying you have I, – I need to – be aware of what my child's doing. I think we can do it the way I said. You can buffer part of it uh, without taking the draconian step of removing the phones themselves. Mike Carl. Well, <clears throat> Bill Bill says we've come a long way. I say we've crashed a, a <laughs> way crashed. down. Yeah. Uh, for, you know, you that, could, that's still going a long way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just well, <laughs> but but it, it, you know that's that that's a progress, technological process progress, but social social decline big time i i think there ab there absolutely should be a law prohibiting uh uh social media re you know in in classrooms mm -hmm. and and there ought to be uh, uh all the means you know the 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 social media you know operators uh not just the users but should should be subject to civil major civil and even criminal penalties for violating that rule and the schools ought you know need to enforce it you know i uh i didn't have a phone in school as you can imagine my age and, and uh and i think it's absurd to 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 have that you know distraction or interruption or you know from what the, the, they're in school to learn what they're being taught in school not anything else back to you joe ferretti yeah, teachers will tell you that, uh, as somebody mentioned, the dialogue on the phone between student and parent during school hours is, is ridiculous and should not be happening. But back to my uh, story about the Utah superintendent who took the call from the distraught parent, the superintendent's response was right along what 
Mike Height suggested. The superintendent told the parent, well, did you, did you ever think about monitoring what your daughter is viewing on her social media accounts? And and so that is, I think, you know, parenting's hard enough as it is. I get it. But uh, I think it's, you know, when you when you have children, that's the bargain you strike. You, you got to parent. And, and these days that includes parenting with social media accounts that are available to these minors. Uh, some states have two-way authentication laws where a parent has to sign on with the child to get on social media accounts. Yes, there's First Amendment concerns about all that, but the bottom line is we know it's harmful. And as a parent, I would have never dreamed of dropping my kid off at some mall or some other person's home or the beach or wherever without fully investigating where my child was going to be and who that my child was going to be with. And I think we have to treat social media much like that with uh, you know, investigation uh, and some kind of, of diligence to make sure that our children are in the right communities, whether they be virtual or real. Good, we, good lead off point here. Do you have a final point, Larry? Yeah, we have the technology today to make a room like the one we're sitting in completely uh, a wasteland of, of uh, internet traffic. Um, it's called a skiff, right? Secure compartmented information, a skiff room. Um, our last president didn't know a whole lot about those. He was using his social media with uh, documents in the room, we hear. But uh, that could be done in every school. Uh, I don't know how much it would cost, but it could be done so that you can't get a cell phone signal in there, period. Thank you, Cliff Maxwell. Welcome back to the program. We are produced by the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin, and brought to you in part by our friends at the Wagner Law Firm. That's uh, Harley Wagner, West Virginia's premier DUI defense attorney. Find out more at West Virginia DUI Lawyers. Uh, dot com. And let's welcome back our uh, Friday panel via telephone. Joe Joey Torts ready. Giuseppe, thank you so much for being with us this Friday. Always glad to be here. Delegate Michael Heights. Good morning, I should turn your guys' mics up there. Delegate Michael Heights. Good morning, Robert. My first day in broadcasting. I'll get it eventually. <laughs> Senior member of our crew, Attorney Michael Carl. Good to be with you. The Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. And uh, Attorney Lawrence Schultz. Good morning, Rob. Good to be here. Donning the Joe Pa blue and whites today. We're State ready parent. to go. You have not shown your hat off yet. You've shown your shirt, but no, not your hat. That's true. It's up to wear a hat over headphones, though. That's the thing. Shirt looks black, <laughs> not blue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what, what, what's the uh, – you got a score prediction here, Larry? Um, you know, um, the national line is 20.5 for those uh, who are interested in such things. Mm -hmm. And here's what I'm finding out. I don't have any West Virginia fan friends who are willing to take the 20.5 <laughs> and bet me 100 bucks. So if there's somebody out there, you know, I, I, I don't have many hundreds. I have 100. <laughs> so if there's somebody out there. But if that's the case. Someone. Uh, someone yeah. out there. <laughs> Mike Carl, any predictions? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm just not optimistic. I've, I've sat in that stadium and saw them lose too many times to have, have any optimism the good thing is that they're playing again and we are all reminded yeah. of the oh, fact yeah, of that's... how stupid college football is that pitt penn state and west virginia are not in the same conference yeah despite the fact that they're not a far drive away from each other yeah i agree uh we uh by the way we are not here monday labor day monday no show so we are back next time on tuesday and labor day breakfast if anybody is wants a good time it's a lot of fun yeah, Labor Day breakfast in the park. I think 7.30 to 10 or until supplies last, as Buzz said yesterday. Uh, for issue number two, we go to the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. You know, Rob, I think the unthinkable happened this past week. You mean the two words you got right on Monday? The two words I got right on Monday. <laughs> the second un come, Come on, Joe. Don't laugh at that. I don't laugh when you've been picked on. Okay. As far as you know. As far as I know. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I'll start again. Rob, <laughs> the, the unthinkable happened. Sorry. The, the uh, indictment against Trump was kicked off the 
headlines in the West Virginia newspapers and replaced by West Virginia University and their $45 million deficit and the action that was been taken. With uh, draconian, has been described, draconian, uh, uncaring cuts with 170, approximately 170 teachers losing their job and departments being folded and the whole bit. The litany goes on and on. And it's cre- has created quite a bit of buzz. Uh, there's the uh, folks like the American Federation of Teachers have jumped in the fray, no surprise. Uh, been pushed back by several of our congressional legislators uh, in defense of West Virginia University. The Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post on two ends of the political spectrum have both uh, jumped in and said, what's going on? Uh, there's been a lot of question raised. Uh, could the could the situation have been averted uh, by more uh, uh, by taking action earlier? Uh, was the uh, legislators partly at fault by uh, flatline budgeting that over time accrued these costs? Uh, there's a whole litany of things that have been and will be discussed. To me, one of the interesting aspects of this, uh, there are several interesting aspects, but one is the question about what we mean, what we're expecting from our four-year institution, especially from our flagship four-year institution. There have been some kind of alluded to the fact that, well, through time, through recent time, the needs have been shifted more from a four-year school to that's been provided by a two-year school, the the trades, if you will. Uh, I guess I would argue there's a niche for both. There's certainly a niche for uh, the trade training. There's also professional training, linguistics, for example, uh, uh, mathematics, uh, and a lot of things. So my question to my colleagues around the table this morning is, has the role of higher education institutions changed or is the problem more localized with just the flagship university in West Virginia? All right. When I posed this to Dr. Hendricks at Shepherd as a way of uh, establishing a yep. line of communications between the university and the uh, House of Delegates member in the studio, it seemed like she seemed to feel like uh, Mr. Height was being set up. So, Mr. Heights, <laughs> we'll come right back to you with the same topic here, basically. Um, so, I... I to answer your first or your second question, I don't think the role for higher education has changed. I think it still has the same role. Um, but like our discussion earlier with with President Hendricks, the institutions of higher education are taking an inward look and and self reflecting, if you will, to determine whether or not they're providing an efficient. Um, manner of education, not just higher education. And a lot of times this is what's needed. When when enrollment is down, um, you sort of have to look inward, you know, and you, you mentioned the two-year degrees. A lot of a lot of students and, and, and uh, kids around the, the state are saying, do I really need a college education? So, and I think that's probably one of the reasons enrollment is down because the cost of higher education. I can, I can go over here and do one of these trades and make just as much money, if not even more, than I can by going to a college. If you look at some of the cuts in WVU, a lot of the cuts are, are of the upper echelon, the, the, the master's programs, master's classes, or the PhD level doctorate um, classes. Um, and I think maybe WV is looking at their programs and saying enrollment is down in these areas and uh, the cost is high in these areas, and that's why we need to make these cuts. And they even brought in a third party to actually look at this um, and and recommend the, the cuts. So you know, I think they're doing the right things. Um, when you're forty five million dollars in the hole, you have to take a hard look at things. Now, when they come in and cut their whole linguistic language program, I, I sort of have some questions there. You know, is was that the best cut you could make? I mean, you you still had things like um, gender studies and women's studies and adventure recreation whitewater rafting and stuff all that's none of that was touched but we we take away some of the the upper echelon math classes upper echelon uh engineering classes and the whole linguistics program 
you know, you have to sort of wonder, do these are these cuts needed? Yes, absolutely. They should be making some cuts with enrollment down. But you sort of look at what they're cutting and what they're leaving in place and saying, eh, there should be some questions here and they should have to answer some questions of why they're cutting what they're cutting. All right. Let's go to Joe Ferretti via telephone. Well, the problem is that for every one of those classes you mentioned, Mike, you can make a case for why they're necessary, such as whitewater rafting. You know, we have a whitewater rafting industry in West Virginia, and I would imagine some of those people who take those classes go on to work in that industry, uh, which supports tourism in the state, which is vital to the state's interest. So, I I mean, that's where the slippery slope comes into play here, where you, you start trying to justify what should be cut and what shouldn't be cut. Uh, could I, could I jump in here for here. a quick second here, though, Joe? And this is kind of specific. Yeah, do, do we really need four years to study how to whitewater raft, though, I think is the bigger question. Is that not like a weekend course? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I'm not familiar enough with it to comment on that. I, I don't know if it's a four-year degree or if it's just a, you can get a minor in it. I, I'm not sure. But I, my point is you can always make a case for any one of these classes. Uh, I think puppeteering was another issue. <laughs> yes. A class that was being cut and and there is a there is a there's a puppeteer two doors down from my office and that's his job uh he came straight from disney and, and opened up that shop and he has weekend events for kids all the time and that's what he does for a living so I, again you can always make a case for any one of these classes but the bottom line here is that i did some research and i know enrollment's down at west virginia university but it's not down everywhere uh, Marshall this year is reporting increased enrollment. Ohio State increased enrollment. Robert Morris, the largest freshman class incoming that they've ever had. These are competitors of WVU. So I think it, be, it can be fairly asked, why are some of these schools thriving and others not? And I, I think there's some rumblings about a no-confidence vote coming up on uh, Gordon Gee. And uh, I, I'm not close enough to WVU to comment on this except to say, that I think that should be on the table because clearly some of these schools are not suffering to the extent WVU is, and I think the question could be asked why. Mike Carl. Well, let me start with saying that I generally do support Gordon Gee, have for quite some time. But this, this is a complex uh, circumstance and of, of, of service and the ec- the economic, you know, how it's provided and what it costs, and the competitive, the competition that's that's out there with other. I mean, West Virginia, you know, residents, students have been in many ways subsidized. They've gotten, you know, for over many years. You know, I I graduated in '68. They've gotten a good education for a relatively low tuition cost. And but but the dynamics of, of of the quality of the service, the competition with other, you know, institutions, the the, the and, and the quality of the education and the price that you know the cost to, to go to those different ones is all you know is a is a ongoing d- dynamic swirling matter. And I just want to add that one of the th- things that that's going to have a real impact in the in the near term you know certainly in the next decade on on that whole dynamic is the loss of the subsidy of federal student loans that enabled the private colleges to raise uh tuition ridiculously uh to uh you know, without without merit, so or without considering all these factors that I'm talking about, the quality of the service, the competition, and the cost of getting the service. So all that's still, but I, I, I'm confident that Gordon Gee is in good sh- position to help respond to this. But but uh, so you don't want to just use him as a scapegoat for all those huge issues that are going on, Larry. Um, Most troubling to me is the loss of linguistics programs. It seems to me that in included in the term university is an idea of cultural language diversity that you take students who grow up in a, you know, where this is kind of a sheltered place or kind of a, 
a quiet place that's off the main beaten path of of American society. We don't have an I-95 running through the middle of our state like a lot of places do. And so there is a tendency for West Virginia to be kind of sheltered. To take away foreign languages invites that to get worse. And I, I don't think it's a great idea. I think that part of it, I'd agree with Mike, is is really kind of a questionable thing. Um, I, if I had to pick which I'd support with my tax dollars, I'd support a Spanish department over anything to do with whitewater rafting. Well, I, <laughs> and let me just add to that that, that all of these cuts are appealable, and, and a lot of them have been appealed. And I've heard recently that they are bringing back the Spanish um, classes back into the school um, and, and one other language. Chinese. Thank you. Um, yeah. So those two will be returning, um, just not the whole linguistic department. But if I can speak to that as well, they had someone from the linguistics uh, on uh, on a uh, statewide show the other day, and she was making a compelling argument that linguistics uh, bring in something like eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. So why do you cut one of the uh, profit that's profitable? Figure? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing is a flagship university, which. <laughs> West WVU is a flagship university, uh, carries certain responsibilities that other state other schools do not, and that I think is provide a wide array of uh, of courses. Uh, cutting higher the graduate degree in mathematics could also be challenge because you're not going to get the world-class minds coming to WVU just for a bachelor's degree. So every one of the cuts can be challenged one way or the other. Uh, I go back to the example that was used by Marshall and to, to some degree with Shepard as well. Uh, they they have addressed the, uh, the enrollment uh, very aggressively, at least in Marshall, both from recruitment and the retention. They are not experiencing the same draw, drawdown in enrollment that WVU has. Uh, so there's a lot of questions embedded in this one point. And, and I think that the discussion that we're having, not only around this table, but statewide, is very healthy. But you made a very valuable point, very viable point a while ago, Mike, when you said that the universities are taking a hard, critical look at their curriculum and how they can save money. Uh, President Hendricks said this earlier. Brad Smith and Marshall has said the same thing. So this has been a, a positive side of it, even though I'm not sure um, every move has been the correct one But WVU. So. For issue number three, we go to Delegate Michael Height. All right. I'm going to go on a national stage here, and, and my, my – uh, point is um mitch mcconnell had uh, another fetterman moment um just the other day and the list is growing with biden and feinstein also showing declines um so my question is should there be a cognitive test for political office before you run all right we'll begin with the most age sensitive member of our community with that question the admiral bill stubblefield <laughs> Yeah, it's easy, Mike, to uh, to look at the examples you've mentioned uh, and say, yes, it should be. However, looking back in time, there have been several very productive members older than these three. Strom Thurmond comes to mind. Uh, Robert C. Berg comes to mind. Uh, very sharp until the very bitter end. Uh, plus the fact and I've used the term aspirational earlier in today's discussion, uh, this would be aspirational, I think, I believe I'm correct, that to put a cognitive test would require a constitutional amendment. And I doubt if you'd get a constitutional amendment uh, passed. Perhaps you would, but I kind of doubt if you would. But there is undoubtedly uh, all of us looking back at these instances and we can cite numerous examples that man we sure wish a younger person was in that job well i don't know that necessarily age you look at fetterman fetterman's not an old yeah, man right, um yeah. by any standards um I, I just it doesn't necessarily have to be with age you like you mentioned there's been a lot of of older individuals that are very very sharp and and i'm not talking about eliminating them I'm talking about the ones that are definitely showing decline, um, and and probably and because the sharper ones would pass a cognitive test. So, you know, you may be right about the constitutionality of it, um, but yeah. 
I want to climb down the chronology step ladder. The next rung down from the Admiral is Mike Carl. Well, I, I, uh, the constitutional issue, I'm not, I'm not sure about. It's uh, the age, the minimum age is is in the it's constitution. Felt, yeah, exactly right. But that's it. But yeah. not for a senator, not for a congressman, only for the president. Uh, yeah, you have to no, be, you have to 30 be a, 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 a 35 to be a, oh, 35, a senator yeah, no, and 25 but, to be a congressman. But, but, 25 or 25. 25. Okay. okay. You got jumped, you got but, double team jumped on that but, one. Yeah. No, but there's no maximum age. That's No, 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 no. no, no. Yeah. The minimum age yeah. Is, yeah. is what I was yeah. referring to. The, but, you know, I, I, I think that, that I don't think it would violate the Constitution to uh, have, you know, laws, <coughs> general statutes, or even just, you know, internal procedures in the in the, the two houses of congress to to have a, a test you know and make make it like a curative thing you know that we're we're helping you <laughs> to make sure you're okay and not going to you know harm yourself let alone the rest of us uh, right. with your with your health problems including your mental health problems all right mr schultz yes i um doubt that in a country that doesn't even have a clear rule that says a convicted felon can't run for president. That we're ever going to get to over the hump of uh, giving one of these memory tests to uh, um, one of these uh, cognitive tests to uh, our candidates. You may recall from years ago, uh, Mr. Trump uh, was talking about how he'd taken and passed one and i don't remember now the phrase that he spewed out that these connected things man woman tv whatever and um uh, it was cause of great hilarity um uh, among really i think trump supporters too uh that he was sort of bragging about how he passed this test um it uh i don't think those things are as reliable as they uh, as they seem, I'm not sure that the quickest responder is the smartest guy in the room. So now, if you're asked a direct question and you're the only one in front of the mic, like Mr. Uh, Carl or like Mr. Um, uh, O'Connell was, then you, you've got to have an answer. You can't start speaking then stop for 25 seconds. That's always you know and. And he looked like he was sailing away. You know, you look at his eyes and it, it looks like he's just going away. It's really sad. Um, I presume that there, he's going to make some adjustments. Whether it will be to step down, I don't know about all that. But he's not going to be giving press conferences and answering questions like that, I don't think, anymore. This morning they were explaining some of that as post-concussion that is not all that uncommon. It t- just could take a while for the brain to completely heal because but, apparently he had a pretty bad concussion but then you have senator feinstein which is not yeah. concussive related right yeah mr right. ferretti well yeah and what's happening with with diane feinstein is a disgrace uh i i can't imagine her family her staff you know they keep trotting her out there and she's clearly impaired she's close to 90 years old and it's just all raw political power that's the only consideration here uh, you know, the, the Senate, we know, is, is is very tight in terms of who's in power, and it, it's just a shame. Uh, I, I feel for her distinguished career, and to see her struggle like she is, uh, is, is really, it's, you can't help but take pity on, it, on her. Uh, interestingly, uh, Senator Bill Cassidy has come out, and said, he's a doctor. He thinks a basic cognitive test should be administered to Senators uh, Nikki Haley, on the campaign trail is openly advocating for cognitive testing for anyone over 75. Of course, that's some political opportunism since she's running against uh, Trump and Biden, who are both over 75. Uh, I, 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 look, there has to be, we have to accept the reality here. These folks are public figures and they are vested with immense major federal authority, decision making, war powers. You name it. This, this, this permeates down through every aspect of our society. These are the folks making decisions. And something has to be done to make sure that they're of right mind when they make those decisions. Well, 
I have a quick you know, question. Just, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Okay. Uh, I guess to Mike the, uh, and Joe, uh, we're talking about a cognitive test for over for folks over 75. I hope that's limited to elected officials and not the folks around this table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this, this is the average here is plus 60. Easy. The average Democratic senator, uh, the start of this Congress was 65 years old. That's an all-time record for age for an average senator in the Democratic Party. The average Republican senator at the moment is 63 at the start of the Congress, which has already been in uh, phase for uh, the better part of the and, year. Or so. And let me clarify a little bit. I'm not, I'm not advocating for a test by age. Correct. Because I don't think age has anything to do with this. Um, Especially as we get older. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Be, and and I'll bring up Fetterman again. I mean, Fetterman is not an old man. So I think there needs to be, if you're going to do cognitive tests, that it needs to be across the board. If you're running for a public office, um, at, at especially at the federal level, then I don't care what age you are. All right, that'll wrap this one up then. Uh, Larry Schultz, you are on the clock. On the birthday front, Barry Gibb, born this date, 1946. Also, Gloria Stefan, 1957. It's uh, a lot of birthdays there with famous in music there. Hold on a second, Billy. Let me turn you up. Okay. You might read Joe Ferretti's, uh a comment on the chat room. I'll tell you what. You're on a linguistic roll yourself today. Why don't you okay. handle that? From Joe Ferretti. Yeah. Would Hornby pass a cog- cognitive test? <laughs> Hornby. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Uh, long you distance. can defend that, Joe. You I, notice I, I said it was from you and not from me. That's a good thing I didn't read that. Chin music from the guy down in Georgia. Absolutely, he would pass a cognitive test. This is not an intelligence test. It's a cognitive <laughs> test. <laughs> Ouch. Mike, Mike, I know you're not listening right now because you're at a very important meeting. But I want you to know you have forever have my loyalty and love. I don't, I don't know what's going on with any of these other people, but I'm here to tell you, you can always count on me, buddy. <laughs> Paydays next week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, this segment of the show brought to you in part by uh, elder care attorney Danny Staggers. If you or a loved one are concerned about going into a nursing home and losing assets, contact elder care attorney Danny Staggers today at Martinsburg at 304-267-3915. Issue number four, we go to the Penn Stater himself, Larry Schultz. Yes, uh, will the 14th Amendment disqualify Donald J. Trump from public office? That's a great uh, as you know, the um, Section 3, written after the Civil War, there's recently been an article in the Atlantic Monthly by um, Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard University and uh, Michael J. Luddig, who's a very conservative sort of opposite view guy, um, to Lawrence Tribe, and they both agree that it's certainly possible. Uh, there was a recent case in Florida that was dismissed uh, for lack of standing when it was just filed by apparently everyday citizens and voters. The question would be, in my mind, what if someone like Mac Warner, a Secretary of State, were to file such a claim and say, I believe it would be unconstitutional for me to place Mr. Trump on the ballot in West Virginia. And I'm not going to do it. Now, Mac Warner's not going to do that. But we can all think of some states where the Secretary of State might say such a thing. And there might have to be a lawsuit from the other side to force him to be put on the ballot. Uh, That would be uh, that would be fascinating to me. And it's a close call. If you've been involved or given aid and comfort to those involved in an insurrection or rebellion, then uh, the the 14th Amendment, which is clearly written to stop a second sort of uh, rise of the South uh, politicians who were all involved in a rebellion, uh, they kind of cut those people out. And so will, would that apply here? Uh, it is it is a permanent amendment to the Constitution, not written for the past, but for the future after the Civil War. Let's go with the attorneys first. Start with Mike Carl. Well, uh, I, I just don't. Uh, I hope this doesn't come up as a serious claim because it'll just distract and then it'll shift, you know, the the influence and power over the you know the election for away from the people and. 
uh, to you know to judges and ultimately <laughs> I guess to the U.S. Supreme Court, which you know I kind of like our chances there, but but uh, that yeah that, that's that's just not the way our system's supposed to work at all. And I don't I, so I, I don't and, and the ambiguity of the underlying facts, you know that 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 what happened in January six, you know, tr- triggered that that issue uh, is is totally ridiculous. I think. Uh, and partly because the system worked, and the vice president did his job, and and it, it, he he may have precluded the attempt, you know, if if it, if it rises even to the level of attempt, you know, but but it, it it wasn't a violation because he did his job, Mr. Ferretti. Yeah, but Mike, are you comfortable with that? whole ordeal coming down to the decision of one man and and whether or not he chose the right path here because we have seen in various states elected officials just itching to go down another path and overturn the election results of their state and have fake electors and and proceed down a very nefarious and dangerous path and i it it gives one pause to know that you know a few individuals were able to stem the tide here and 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 resist the power of the presidency uh and all the pressure that was exerted to try to overturn this election it it just gives me pause but uh, larry to your question uh what's interesting to me is going to be uh the efforts of Republicans and conservatives to use this 14th Amendment argument. The members of the Federalist Society, and we know who they are, they've come forward and said this is a legitimate constitutional challenge to Trump's qualifications to run for president. Uh, In New Hampshire, conservatives have been hiring lawyers to bring a case forth to challenge Trump's appearance on the ballot under this theory. And you can bet that when people project what's going to happen in the upcoming election and they see that Trump is both their champion with regard to the primary season, but an albatross around their neck when it comes to a general election, I suspect there's going to be a fair number of Republicans and conservatives who utilize this tactic to challenge Trump to get him off the ballot and to get somebody else nominated who stands a better chance of winning a general election. That's what I look forward to. Mike Height. So the first thing I'm I'm looking at here is, you know, if, if, if the constitution prevents somebody from being on the ballot because they're a felon and, or an insurrectionist, um, first they have to be found guilty of, of that crime. And, Donald Trump is presumed innocent until he is convicted of said crime. So how would you bring a case right now when he is an innocent man to keep him off of the ballot? How would you bring that case when your your whole case is founded upon him being found guilty in the future? And it, to me, it's an unfounded case at this point in time until he has has gone through the whole uh, judicial system and is found guilty of these crimes that that are alleged at this point, you can't keep him off. You can't use the 14th Amendment because he's an innocent man at this point. So I would say all of this is unfounded until such a time as he is found guilty in the future, if so. There is the language um, that that you always look for when you're reading a legal document, these sort of... um, at the end of the sentence, it always appears at the end. And there is language in the section three that says, or gave aid and comfort to the enemies thereof. So the enemies of the United States or the enemies of the Constitution. And, and so that doesn't suggest necessarily a criminal proceeding, but a, a decision. Did he give aid and comfort to those thousand people who have now been prosecuted uh, for that thing. And, and and I was going to say about Mr. Trump, or about Mr. Pence, he ran out of the building. We've all seen the video of him going out of the building, 
And it's been reported, I don't know how clearly or certainly, but it's been reported that a Secret Service car uh, from the Trump Secret Service detail was waiting there for him and offered to um, take him away from the Capitol. And he said, I'm not getting in that car. (laughs) That's a pretty telling piece of evidence about Mr. Pence's state of mind regarding the Secret Service people who were dealing with Mr. Trump. Agreed. I think he, but, what, you know. what you're saying, you still have to prove that he gave aid and comfort. You, the, all of these things have to be proven before you can enact the 14th Amendment. It, it, the problem is it doesn't say convicted of giving aid and comfort to the enemy, but just that he did. And I'm sure if you go back to what they were writing about, which was the Civil War, <laughs> the entire South was the enemy. Right, that they're focused on, and there were never any trials. So your contention <laughs> is it doesn't have to be proved. It, it it doesn't have to be proved in a court of law, because it's not a separate crime. They're not talking about the crime of giving aid and comfort to the enemy. It was simply if you did that, um, and and they had to write it that way because there was so little. They weren't enforcing those laws in the South, obviously, because those guys were helping out the home team. Um, (laughs) The problem was the home team was uh, the enemy of the United States. I have to agree with with Larry. You don't have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That that language is not in there. And, And so if you establish it by a preponderance of the evidence that they gave aid and comfort, then then that that rule was triggered but uh, but let me just add the system worked uh trump was absolutely wrong uh the few nut cases that came to the capitol and you know tried to block the the certification in elections and so forth uh you know they're they're wrong uh but the system but the system worked It, it withstood these efforts and that's what's most important Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, going back to uh, what you said uh, earlier, Larry, about uh, Pence. It's my understanding that Pence said not because he feared his own safety. He said, my job, my my duty is here. So that that's a different light on that situation. Uh, the other thing, this issue of 14th Amendment has received quite a bit of interest among constitutional lawyers. I, I'm not one. Uh, some of the, they, they appear to be split the, whether or not it applies uh, prior to indictment or not. So both of you may be right. I don't know. I don't think the constitutional lawyers know this. But an interesting aspect of this is if uh, uh, going to this election, uh, both sides are going to be taking a much harder look at vice presidents than what they normally would. Camilla Harris on the Democratic side and a possibility of Lake, Marjorie Taylor Greene, or Ramasamy on the Republican side. Of course, all of these are speculation, but they're the names that have been thrown out. So as a voter, you, pri- you generally you look at the, the number one person on the, candidate, uh, on the uh, uh, election ballot. This time, I think we'll be taking a hard look at the number two person. Good point, Bill. All right. Uh, Comes back to you, Larry, for the final point. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think it's a great thing that in this country we can have this debate. Uh, It's an important debate to have, regardless of how it turns out, uh, regardless of whether the Supreme Court makes the ultimate decision. And the lawyers down in Florida who filed that lawsuit that got dismissed, uh, I'm not sure they did a lot of thinking about whether they had standing or not. Um, if they had standing, then every single breathing human being in the United States would have standing. And the courts aren't real crazy about that kind of standing rule. Um, they want somebody with an actual duty bound interest in it, uh, to press forward with the case. And that's, I think a good weeding out. All right. The anchor man of our five leg relay is Michael Carl, sir. Just shift slightly subjects. Can Donald Trump politically afford to skip the second GOP presidential debate uh, under the current circumstances? That's the question I'm throwing out. All right, Mike, you go first. 
Uh, so the short answer is yes, I think he can. He has such a substantial lead right now, and I don't see it going down. I don't think he can skip all of the debates, all of the primary debates. Sooner or later, he's going to have to get in, into the mix and, and start throwing punches like he, he usually does. Um, but I think this second one, he can, he can afford to, to miss, and maybe even a third one. Um, but as it, time gets closer, and I think maybe he's waiting for some of them to drop out and, and, and maybe he doesn't have to go up against as many. Um, but strategically, I don't see any, any strategic advantage to him getting into a debate, especially with all the lawsuits that are going on right now um, where anything he says could be held against him. Um, so right now, I would stay out of the debates if I were him. Now, if his poll numbers start to drop, then he'll have to take a harder look at it and say, you know, if especially if people start dropping out and you see a DeSantis or a Ramaswamy or somebody like that start to rise in the polls, he's going to have to get in to knock them back down. Billy? But in the absence of the poll shifting, I don't think he needs to get in the uh, debate either for the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, regardless of the number. Uh, it sh the poll numbers show he did not take a hit at all uh, after the first debate. In fact, he may have uh, he take, took advantage of it or was taking advantage of it. Uh, so all of us would like to see him in the debate. We would like to see the, the podium full of folks. But I do not believe you're going to see Donald Trump in the debate unless his poll numbers start going south. Larry. Um, I believe that's true. The one problem with that is sometimes your poll numbers start going south and they can't be stopped. Um, you know, it's like a snowball going down a mountainside and pretty soon it's bigger than a house. Um, and so he's got to pick, if he's going to skip debates, he's got to be careful because he could show up one debate too late and it would be over. Let me respond very quick to Larry, and I think you're right, but there's one uh, proviso. Uh, if his numbers go south, they have to be accompanied by one or two individuals, the very most, poll numbers going up. And right now, we've not seen any indication of anybody else leaving the pack with increased poll numbers. I, I just want to um, see, and, and, and the further debates may not be on Fox News, and so they'll ask him, why would you be a better president than Donald Trump? Which we didn't hear. Um, and once they focus it that way and they're answering a question, sort of, hey, I didn't come here to attack the guy, but you asked me this question, so now I'm going to tell you why. Um, if they get that question out, that could be the moment he will wish he was there. Um uh, I don't know how he would respond to that question. How would you be a better president than Donald Trump? Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a little self-referential, but, uh, you know, he might have a very clever answer for that. I don't know. Mr. Ferretti. Well, Mike Carl, I, I keep, you know, political impact of not debating. I, I keep waiting for some event or circumstance that's going to affect Donald Trump's popularity especially with his base, and I've yet to see that over the course of now six years uh, with him in office and out of office. So I, I think, you know, I, he can – I think he can easily choose not to debate at all and probably not suffer terribly. However, I, I think the overriding concern is what criminal defense attorney worth his salt or her salt is going to allow Trump to go debate and start riffing on everything – when he's got criminal jeopardy awaiting him. And I think I get the sense that, that something is hitting at home with Trump at this point, that he understands to some degree he is in jeopardy in terms of his liberty interest. And, uh, I, you know, he may actually listen to an attorney at this time and say, I better not debate. Uh, I, I would hope, but as an attorney's perspective on this, but, uh, Bottom line is, I, I don't think politically he can do anything wrong. Comes back to you, Mike. Well, let me say that uh, in the last, you know, several days, or certainly since the the first debate, and, and somewhat be before that, all Trump's uh, 
image has been that of you know that he's created that of a uh, uh, you know a person who's being wrongly you know persecuted and prosecuted and has nothing to do with what the policies and the substantive policies that the people care about the voters care about and 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 he he needs to change the subject and get back to public policy and 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 why you should care about him not just because he's a been you know uh, uh attacked you know by, uh, wrongfully he says uh you know for for the for the past he he needs to change so i think he does need to get back on and i said you know as 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 a perceived part of the trump base you know he, he perceives it, or his his organization does. Uh, I see signs that that there is a decline, both in 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 his, in his uh, the strength of his support, and and, and certainly in, in in his financial resources because of the lawyers' fees. As you know, it's good for the legal profession. But 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 I, but I I think I think he's starting to feel that, and I think I think. Uh, the time is coming when when he he needs to change the subject and get back to to why he believes he was popular in the first place and not because he's a victim. I think at the, when we get to the point where the mugshot T-shirt sales have fallen off enough, then he'll get in. <laughs> <laughs> right now, those things thirty five bucks a piece for a T-shirt with a mugshot on it. Um, better they're be going one, like hotcakes. Better be one comfortable T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it, Mike Carl makes a great point. At some point in a Republican primary, we got to start talking about real issues here. And then when it gets to a general election, it's got to be more than don't let, don't vote for Trump because he's a maniacal crook and don't vote for Biden because he's a feeble crook. Uh, I mean, it, we, we got to have something that we can go on better than that as a reason to vote for someone or against somebody. Right. But Absolutely. At the at the first Republican debate, Nikki Haley did just that. I don't think the others did, but Nikki Haley provided thoughts, provoking mm-hmm. ideas that uh, that I think yeah. appealed to and, a large and, and the threat and the threat the threat of her and other any, the other candidates is why he needs to get back and talk talk issues and not just about how he's being attacked. This segment of our show today brought to you by CMA Honda of uh, Winchester. And we send you into the break with a warning that final thoughts are next. You get eight seconds apiece. Unless you're Mike Height, apparently, then you may not even get that. Or Larry Schultz. Or Larry Schultz. <laughs> to Larry Schultz here. Uh, also, uh, Yvonne DiCarlo, Lily Munster from the Munsters, born this date, 1922. We're back with the final minute next. Final thoughts. We begin on the phone with you, Joe. Joe, towards for ready. Mount Mayors, enjoy your trip to beautiful Happy Valley. My sympathies in advance for the result. Mr. Happy Valley himself, Larry Schultz. Let Mike Hike be heard. <laughs> oh, my, the Admiral. <laughs> yeah, it's come to my attention one of our elected officials may not go to the breakfast on Monday. Shame, shame, shame. Everybody else should go out and enjoy. Mike Carl. The cards are behind the Pirates three games, but they start a three-game series, and if they win tomorrow night, I'm going to skip the Penn State game. <laughs> Porn stash cuddle bear. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go, Mountaineers. Let's beat that state pin. <laughs> hey, have a great Labor Day weekend. Enjoy the breakfast. It's 10 o'clock. Dave Ramsey shows next. This is Talk Radio 